Good evening, everyone. I'm Ken Tate. I'm the Director of Development and External Relations for the Department of Computer Science. On behalf of our department, all our faculty, I just want to welcome all of you. Thank you for taking time out of your night. I'm sure you've got plenty of things to do, but you chose to be here. And this is the LabCorp Leadership in Technology Speaker Series. I just want to say a word about that. Anybody here from LabCorp? I didn't see anybody, but uh, if they're watching online, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, a little history here. This uh, speaker series started 16 years ago, and it started as the Fidelity Investment Series. So maybe for most of you students, you don't remember that because COVID kind of interrupted that. But uh, we're very thankful that LabCorp picked up the sponsorship, and we're also very thankful that they have renewed that sponsorship for another three years. Um, I'll make a couple announcements before we get going. Now would be a great time to like silence cell phones or anything that might be a distraction to those around you. And to um, point out that we are, in fact, streaming this live. If you know somebody who couldn't be here, you might just want to ping them now and tell them that they can catch this as a link uh, on the news story that will allow them to watch it live. Uh, or they can watch it later because we're recording it and we'll put it up on our site. Um, since we started this series 16 years ago, and we've had almost 100 speakers now, the intent has been to provide students, not just computer science students, but we have some ECE students here tonight, welcome, uh, but to provide students from across campus with some visibility into this world of leadership and technology, and it is a quite unique world. We've had speakers that have spoken on almost every topic that you imagine. If you came last month, you heard the least technical talk that I have ever heard. It was fantastic. It was very motivational, but it was non-technical. And then we're making a big switch tonight. We're going to go much more technical, and we're going to talk about quantum computing. So with that as our um, kind of our, our lead-up, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Richard Tychansky. So I'm not going to try to cover everything that's in his bio. bio. It's just way too extensive, but I want to say this. Uh, Richard is a security architect with Identity Dyna Dynamics Corporation, and his impressive career spans aerospace engineering with Lockheed Martin, commercial software product design with SAS, and recently uh, he worked with Google in their security and privacy division to protect the data of over a billion mobile device and cloud service users. But perhaps he's best known and regarded as a quantum computing advocate for today's developers. He's a prolific, highly rated conference speaker, and he serves as a community champion for more than 160,000 ISC cybersecurity professionals. He is also the author of the popular Preparing for a Zero Trust Initiative Professional Development Institute course. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our special speaker tonight, Richard Tychansky. Richard. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, post-quantum computing and the drive towards standardization. It's really kind of an interesting story that I've got to tell here. Um, let me get my clicker working. Uh, okay, there we go. So uh, I've got a couple of learning objectives and I'm going to cover these kind of very broadly. And I know everybody has, is coming into this with a different background. And what I really want you to really kind of understand and as a kind of a takeaway today is really to understand a little bit about quantum computing. If you're not in that program, that's okay. I'll go through some of the background. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the standardization process that NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is putting forward. And we're gonna talk about some of their they're candidates for post-quantum computing um, and standardization um, and what that means. So we'll go over some of the federal information processing standards. We'll talk about those. I'm not going to get into any of the algorithms per se. That's another talk for another day. Um, but we'll talk about really the risk. And that's really the point that I wanted to talk about is really the risk that quantum is presenting to cybersecurity today um, and what we can do about it. Um, so that's the story from beginning to end is what can we do today to protect our systems, um, you know, uh, given that there is this risk of, of, of uh, harvesting now and decrypting later. Um, that is one of the biggest risks for quantum computing. 
So uh, a few assumptions that I have here is that you know a little bit about quantum computing. Um, in that paradigm, um, you've got a knowledge of prime numbers. Uh, everybody, uh, I think, is, is probably taken that in their math classes. Um, you know a little bit about symmetric and asymmetric cryptography and how that works and some familiarity with NIST standards. Um, and I'm not saying that you've got to know NIST if you're, if you haven't been, if you're not familiar with those standards, well, today's your opportunity to become familiar, familiar with them. Um, and we've got a lot of slides. We've got a lot of slides to go through today. Hopefully we will make it through. Um, so there are some different technologies for making qubits. Sorry. Um, and depending upon whether you're using IBM Q or Microsoft or ion Q, there's, you can either use superconducting loops, trapped ions for ion Q. Uh, my, uh, Intel, I believe, uses the sil silicon graphic dots. Um, and then Microsoft uses the topological qubits. So a little bit about quantum versus classical computing. Um, we're all familiar with, you know, building software in C, C++, Java, Go. You pick your language, you compile it, and then you execute it on a classical computer and you get your answer. Um, in a quantum computer, it's a little bit different with the way the algorithms are working. And if, is anyone programming on a quantum computer today? Quiz kit, anyone? No? Okay. Um, I think I did see a hand. Great. Um, so you're familiar with circuits, programming the circuits, et cetera. And it's a really, it's a different paradigm itself where you're actually programming those quantum circuits. You're compiling for that hardware, that native hardware, and you're really trying to converge on a solution more than anything. Um, right now, one of the biggest problems with quantum is noise and error correction. So they're trying to Still do a lot of work on that. There are a lot of papers out there. Um, you'll see in my links, and I've got uh, a list of resources. Uh, you'll see learning with errors and error corrections. Um, uh, you'll see links to those kinds of papers. Um, so the quantum computing paradigm really kind of presents this problem for us where we've got this noisy computer and if it ever reaches this state of where we can do error correction, um, we'll be able to program solutions, we'll be able to break our quantum, or sorry, today's legacy, I'll call it legacy, um, cryptographic algorithms. So again, when we're talking about quantum, we're talking about the quantum speed up. And this is where, um, and it's really quite simplified here. The yellow line is really um, the quantum computer, but it's in, in terms of its rate of being able to solve problems. It looks like a very uh, straight linear line. Um, it isn't. It's just flattened out uh, over time. <clears throat> so again, this, I, I'm trying to build a case here for the time that it takes to break a cryptographic algorithm. So back in 2015, NSA announced that it's, it was going to start retiring its sweep B algorithms and move towards quantum resistant algorithms. Um, it said that because at the time, they realized that the length of time that it took to actually um, migrate a system to use more um, modern technology took years. And you see that today with a lot of companies that are migrating from one technology to another. It takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of budget. Um, and um, so they started planning back in 2015. I think there are several memos since then still stating the case for, you know, we've got to start moving away to uh, post-quantum resistant algorithms. And we're gonna get into some of those post-quantum resistant algorithms in a few minutes. Um, but some of the classical algorithms, I will say, are something that you see every day when you're in a web browser and you're using HTTPS. Um, what it's doing is it's connecting 
from a server to a client uh, in a secure, it's securing the communications between and the data flow between the client and the server uh, using these, uh, the secure protocol. And it's using uh, Cypher suites as well. Now, and that's where we kind of get into um, the um, post-quantum computing algorithms is that we want something that is secure, it's unbreakable uh, for a given period of time that the certificate has a validity period for. And I'm going to show you a simple formula in a little while um, that talks about the shelf life of that algorithm versus how long we expect our, our cryptographic keys to live for. And hopefully this is making sense for you. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways of, of doing crypto. Um, there is Diffie-Hellman, uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, RSA. RSA is our biggest concern um, because it's premised on the fact that you can factor very large prime numbers efficiently. And we'll get into that. We'll talk a little bit about some of these algorithms, whether it's RSA or it's elliptic curve, um, what, what algorithms we can use to actually um, break, uh, break the crypto. Um, I always like to say, and this is kind of a, uh, an unusual thought, but you know, the internet uh, cryptographic apocalypse is coming. So this is where, again, quantum computers have reached the state of usability and their error correction is such that um, we're able to, um, without a doubt, break crypto. Um, and that hasn't been done today, despite what you read in the news. So again, the whole goal is being able to transmit secret messages or store secret messages in using a cryptographic algorithm that is unbreakable. And let me just... So one of the reasons we're doing that is, you know, we're looking for the sufficient power and size of a cryptographic uh, algorithm and the inputs to that algorithm, the parameters that we're using into that algorithm that, um, that are not easily broken um, and that we have some control over. Now you will see when we start talking about post-quantum is that some of the algorithms, they're still under discussion, they're still in draft form, and a lot of the concern is around some of the parameters. Um, there is NSA that says, hey, some of these parameters need to be defined. They can't change, as opposed to, you know, we wanted some, we wanted to build in randomness into the algorithms. Um, so that debate is still going on uh, between NIST and NSA and, and mathematicians uh, that are writing the algorithms. A lot of the algorithms, um, uh, that are being put forth for standardization are um, being modified by NIST when they get into the standardization process, uh, which is, again, quite unusual because if you think about an algorithm that a mathematician or a set of mathematicians have created, it still gets modified. At the end of the day, it will still get modified by NIST before it gets standardized. And again, national security concerns um, uh, are one of, the, one of the reasons for that. So I mentioned one of the biggest risks for, for quantum today is harvest now and decrypt later. And it really depends upon your organization. And I've worked in many different organizations and the risk level is different in each one of those organizations according to whether I'm processing personal identifiable information or personal health information. Um, it's all different. Um, when we're talking about protecting financial resources and prote protecting communications on the internet itself, again, that's where these algorithms come into play. It's seamless 
as HTTPS is seamless today for many of our users, um, you don't get to see that. You don't need to know what cipher suites are being used by that particular algorithm. End user doesn't really um, have the need to know, as the only thing that they need to know is that their communications are, are secure, they're unbreakable. If I'm doing my bank account or any kind of financial transaction on my machine, it's secure, and it's secure for a period of time that if, if that traffic was intercepted and stored for decryption later by, let's say, a nation state, then um, you would want to know that you were protected for you know, that, that, that period of time. So breaking today's crypto, again, one of the big problems is we're focusing on RSA. RSA, um, we've been using that for 30 years, and it's the backbone of, you know, it's, it's, it's used for key exchange in asymmetric cryptography, public key cryptography. Uh, more other pr traditional crypto systems like AES are also going to be affected as well. Um, and what a quantum computer will do will be to effectively reduce its strength, the strength of the algorithm, um, 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 up to a power, I'm going to say, I don't have it here. Um, it will effectively reduce its, its power um, in half. And I believe I have a chart that actually shows that. So let's, let's go to that. So we're, again, we're thinking about more secure internet protocols. This is something that is built into the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. Those are the people that write the standards. Um, they wrote the standards for OAuth, OIDC, uh, SAML, HTTPS, et cetera. So we haven't seen them yet write a standard that is using post-quantum computing or PQ, PQC, um, that's yet to come. So let's talk about some of the algorithms that we can use to break today's crypto. So that's RSA and elliptic curve cryptography. Um, Shor's algorithm, has anyone heard, have you heard of Shor's algorithm before? Shor's, okay, I see lots of heads nodding. Shor's algorithm, again, being able to use that for factoring, um, for factoring, finding the prime numbers that, that are being used to create that private key. So asymmetric cryptography, you've got a public key and a private key. A lot of the times they use the analogy of Bob and Alice um, being able to talk and secure their communications together. One of the things about Shor's algorithm it is that it runs exponentially faster than the best known classical algorithm for factoring. Uh, and Grover's algorithm, which came years later, runs quadratically faster than the best possible uh, uh, quantum, or sorry, classical algorithm um, and for the same task in doing a linear search. The challenge is, and what I've seen is, and why I asked this question about, are people programming today? You know, a lot of We've spent the last, I think, three to four years really talking about whether quantum computing is really um, something that is doable, something that is real. And I think every day that you pick up the news, you see something new in quantum. A new company has just started a startup, and they're already surpassing IBM or Microsoft in terms of the number of qubits that they're using uh, um, um, in their systems. So one of the problems is, you know, how can we, they're still dealing with the problem of error correction in their systems. And we're looking for the point in time where we can actually predict when that quantum machine will be able to break our classic cryptography. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, in terms of algorithms, we've got AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, 
Um, that's, uh, I think it's FIPS, oh, I'm only guessing here, FIPS 197, it could be 193. Um, but that's used for symmetric key cryptography. So that's where you want to, um, and many of these are built into your, into your Java libraries, Java libraries or Bouncy Castle, whatever you're using to program crypto. Um, and so the problem here is that with, uh, with AES is that we're saying it's safe if you use larger key sizes. So something greater than 1024, 2048 bits. Um, that's going to mathematically make the problem of, 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 of trying to solve for the, pub, the private key uh, much harder. Uh, the same with SHA, the SHA family, SHA2, SHA3. These are hash functions for integrity. A lot of the times, they're, you, again, you're, this is used behind the scenes by many by pieces of software by, uh, to do integrity checks. And then we have RSA. Again, it's no longer going to be secure because we're going to be able to factor prime numbers. And then we've got elliptic curve uh, did DSA for digital signature algorithm. Um, again, um, it's no longer going to be secure as in uh, other, DS, other digital signature algorithms. So, okay, yeah, the pointer is not working. Um, so with cryptography, again, we've got two families. We've got asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. And you can see here, with, with the, we're, we're mainly concerned with this asymmetric. This is our public key encryption, where we're actually using that um, encryption. We're creating secure channels between our clients and our servers. And a lot of the times, and what's neat about this chart here is that for symmetric, asymmetric cryptography, we're saying, okay, what is the mathematical problem that we have to solve for to break the crypto? And that's uh, integer factorization with RSA, elliptic curve, um, we're solving four points on the curve. Uh, there are very s discrete uh, um, curve sizes that NIST has in its standards and discrete logarithm problems for Elgamal. El 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 uh, does anyone recognize this number? Anyone? Currently, it's the largest known prime number. Uh, to actually write this number out, I would have to use, I think it's, uh, I took my notes here. It's over two, it's over 200, sorry, 852 million digits. <laughs> That's a really big number. Um, and there's actually, it was founded by, there's a nonprofit institute that sponsors the finding of prime numbers. And actually, they're quite close. They're in Boone County. Yeah which I found very fascinating. So, um, so it is the largest known prime number. Smaller numbers under, than, uh, under, than, under, under 100 are numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 15, 17. Um, but again, this one, this one again is, 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 is one of the largest. Uh, Peter Shore, again, Shore's algorithm, uh, honorable mention for Peter Shore is, you know, he started thinking about quantum crypto back in 1994 uh, when he wrote his algorithm and he kind of postulated this, this idea that if there was a quantum computer and it was able to program it, um, and I don't think he knew anything about circuits or anything about kind of the topology of our quantum systems and the way they operate today. But 
he, he had this idea that he could actually create this algorithm that would find the prime numbers for public keys uh, in RSA. And, and so we're still at this point in here today where, you know, what we've got, we've, we've, we've gotten past today, but we're in this, the availability zone for a quantum computer. And that's what really matters. Um, but again, because of the noiseless state of a quantum computer, we can't get good results. I've heard that, oh, you could factor RSA 2048 with a 20 million qubit machine, um, very noisy. Um, whether that's truth, truthful or not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but um, it, you see these in the news all of the time. Um, be careful with what you read. That's all I can say is that a lot of the times when someone comes up and says, yes, I've refactored RSA, um, okay, it, show me the academic paper. Show me the algorithms that you used. Show me your quiz kit code that you wrote to actually break this thing. Um, what's really cool is quiz kit, if you are writing it, um, there is Shor's algorithm is available, so you can run it natively on a quantum computer, which is really cool. Um, and you know the problem is again, we're trying to protect billions of devices, and how are we going to actually um, ensure the security of these devices over time? That's a really hard thing um, because again, that's the length of time that it's going to take from day zero, having a quantum computer break our crypto, to, um, yeah, to, to day zero, where we've got to actually upgrade our devices so that they're secure. But wait, it gets better. Um, Oded uh, Regev, um, he's a mathematician out of uh, New York University. And he actually came up with this idea that, you know, you could, you could factor in-bit integers in a multi-dimensional space. And I would have shown you the, the, the video for this, but if you check out his paper here, it's the most leading edge paper um, that's out there right now in terms of taking Shor's algorithm and Grover's searching algorithm much farther into the future um, and being able to show how you can factor uh, prime numbers. And he's not making any statements like that, that, hey, I can break crypto. Um, but he's saying that you give me a very large prime number and I can, I can factor it for you. Um, so his paper, Regev's paper, um, really set, has set the standard now for what we've thought about over the past 30 years in terms of Shor's algorithm and what we could do with Shor's algorithm to actually, um, you know, prevent um, or, you know, have the ability to factor efficiently prime numbers. So again, it is a very good read, that paper. So let's start talking a little bit about um, post-quantum computing now and the, the PQC uh, competition, we'll call it that, or you know, uh, road to standardization. And it started back in 2016 with over 82 different submissions. Um, not all of them, you can see over time, um, not, many of them have dropped out. And what they did was NIST asked teams of mathematicians and cryptographers to actually get together and work on these problems together as teams. So where you see a lot of the different algorithms like chrysalis dilithium or chrysalis uh, kyber, algorithms like that, um, and they all have fancy names and, you know, it's uh, no pun intended, they all come from Star Wars. But, um, a lot of the algorithms drop out over time as they've been broken or have the, the, the mathematical proofs for them 
are such that you know, they've found weaknesses in their algorithms. And that's as much as I'm going to say uh, about that. Today, there are four algorithms, one for key exchange and three others for digital signatures that are being um, 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 put forth for standardization. And then there's going to be another one called Falcon that is going to replace AES. Uh, and that, that standardization should be coming uh, next year sometime. So one of the big problems, though, is how do we assess, or how does NIST assess these algorithms based upon their cryptographic strength? Um, and so there's a number of ideas here. And what I haven't seen in any of the literature or any of the discussion online, there's a PQC Google form uh, as well, um, is the ability to you know, program, program these algorithms on a quantum machine. They're all running and they're all testing the performance statistics on a classical computer. And to me, that they're kind of, they still need to make that jump in terms of being able to, um, you know, show that the performance is, um, is going to actually meet or exceed the, the, the specification in their standards. So a lot of the times for, um, you know, you've got some security um, parameters here, and a lot of the times it's, you know, we're looking for things like exhaustive key search, collision, collisions, and we're trying to find a happy medium here between what the algorithm can do versus what our specification, and remember the, the crypto, if you can call it the crypto period, that this uh, algorithm would provide us an assurance level uh, in terms of being able to protect our data. So that's what we're looking for. Um, some other ways of thinking about post-quantum computing and, again, looking at these algorithms that they're putting forward for standardization is how do we test them? So they're looking at it from a performance perspective. Uh, I had a gentleman come up to me before the talk started and says, yeah, I'm looking for the ability to tamper with these algorithms. I'm looking for whether they are uh, resistant to side channel attacks. Uh, I'm looking for the ability um, of whether they're collision resistant. Um, so there are some tools out there. PQ Bench is one of them. Um, and it's used for, again, testing these, these algorithms uh, according to specifications. And a lot of cryptographers, a lot of mathematicians and computer science people will spend time actually looking at these algorithms from a performance perspective because, um, and if anybody remembers Blackberries, <laughs> Blackberries, they had this, they, they were one of the first to use elliptic curve cryptography. And they did that in a very small form factor. Um, and they were able to actually, you know, outperform other cryptographic algorithms on that small form factor to protect information. Um, I like this here, Feather Duster. It's an automated modular cryptanalysis tool, a, a weapon of math destruction. <laughs> that's the best, that's my humor for tonight, guys. That's the best I can do. Um, but again, it's being able to break cryptography in a way in, in such a way that, you know, nation state actors are well funded. Um, not everyone has, oh, I shouldn't say not everyone has the ability to reach out and use a quantum computer because they do today. You can use it as a service. You can reach out, you can use IBM Q, um, you can sign up for Amazon Bracket, and you can get access to any one of the different topologies that we noted today uh, for the different ways of creating qubits. 
and you can program your own Shores algorithm or Grover's search algorithm, or, or even start thinking about Regev's uh, algorithm in multi-dimensional space um, and thinking about programming that. And I looked at his paper and I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to take this algorithm, these algorithms that he has over nine pages and actually program that? I'm not a great programmer. Um, I'm a little bit of a hacker. Um, but um, if anyone is up to that challenge, um, you know, definitely go for that. So I want to take the talk now into a little bit of a discussion about risk. And we talked about quantum and being really, you know, a system that has a lot of utility. It has a lot of utility for modeling, for climate modeling, for healthcare modeling, et cetera. And it has this risk, an inherent risk with it from a security, a cyber perspective. Um, and that's something, again, we need to be attuned to. But again, depending upon your use of quantum and whether you're at that intersection with security or not, um, it may or may not be a concern for you. Um, and this is, this, this is just the stack in terms of talking about different applications that are going to use our uh, different post-quantum computing cipher suites, okay? So I mentioned a little bit already about um, um, the selected PQC algorithms. Um, and again, Chrysalis Kyber, um, which is um, equivalent to um, uh, 1,024 bits, um, is equivalent to AES-256. And our digital signature algorithms, again, the problem with the, the DSAs was the output, and we wanted to ensure that the output from these digital signature algorithms was sufficiently long enough that, again, we couldn't reverse engineer. And so we've got three candidates there, Chrysalis Dilithium, Falcon, and Sphinx. So let's go into some of the standards. Um, FIPS, 1, FIPS 203 is a module latest based key encapsulation mechanism, KEM. So again, I've got to be able to transmit, create a secure connection between my server and my client or two clients, two people that want to exchange confidential information. And I want to be able to do that in such a way that I can exchange a private key um, with them um, and, and it remains secure. FIPS 204, again, this one talks about digital signature algorithms. So this one is for dilithium, I believe. And again, we're trying to ensure that the integrity of a message um, has this uh, digital signature stamp on it so that when I'm transmitting it, I can check the, the it's kind of like an MD, I shouldn't say MD5, because MD5 is so old and so um, uh, broken because it's collision, it's not collision resistant, um, but it's analogous to that if you haven't heard of, you know, other forms of you know, cryptographic hashing, for instance, okay? And then FIPS 205 is, is the third in this trilogy for digital signatures. And it is, again, meant to replace the SHA-3 uh, family of algorithms. So what can we do today? You know, we know that we're, our, our current legacy Crypto systems are susceptible to uh, harvest now, decrypt later attacks, man in the middle attacks as well. Um, so our financial systems are potentially at risk if we don't do something, we don't start thinking about migrating today to, um, um, to more secure algorithms. And so here's kind of a four step, four phase process to do that. And one, it's preparing a cryptographic inventory. So all the applications in your organizations that use crypto, 
you're going to create uh, an inventory that says these are all the algorithms and these are all the cipher suites that are being used today and you'll understand all of the different risks associated with them. Um, you also look at, um, discuss, if many of you go to conferences, um, you discuss, start discussing with vendors on their, on their use of post-quantum uh, in their products. That's what usually drives the market forward. Um, and then assessing supply chain readiness and then number four is really knowing your adversaries. Um, and a lot of, when you're working with large corporations, will give you threat intel to really know who your adversaries are. Um, there's a lot of great books out there on knowing your adversaries and knowing their tools and techniques and procedures. Uh, MITRE does a lot of work in that area as well too. If you go to MITRE.org, um, you'll see the um, MITRE attack. So let's think about quantum risk and let's put it into this formula. Uh, this is a theorem by uh, Michelle Mosca uh, and he said, you know, very simply, if X plus Y was greater than, than, than Z, then we, you gotta worry. You gotta worry a lot because Y is the amount of time the, in years that it's going to take you to migrate your systems over to using post-quantum computing algorithms. And then X is the amount of years that your cryptographic key needs to remain secure. So again, we're concerned here about um, the exposure of our secret keys over time. Um, because over time, again, depending upon whether it's a classical com computer or a quantum computer, you're going to be able to break those keys. And then once you've broken those keys, w a lot of the times the problem is, is with certificates in, in, uh, in browsers today. They're good for four or five years. Sometimes they're good for 10 years. The certificate chain is, has a, valid, a crypto validity period for that long. And if it's valid for that long, then that gives me more time as an attacker to actually deconstruct or decrypt uh, the private key and then get access to uh, all of the sensitive information. And then Z was, um, um, sorry, that's my Canadian pronunciation. Um, Z is, um, is the crypto period, the amount of time that, and this is an unknown today. It's, people ask me, this is Richard, when is a quantum computer going to be of sufficient power and they're going to have the error correction under control such that I'm able to break crypto? A lot of people, I saw a date the other day, 2035, 2035, quite possibly could be the date. I don't know. Everyone says it's always five years off, five years from today. With the advances in quantum crypto and quantum hardware, I really see that, you know, I would say five years. Um, it's hard to say. There's, you know, a lot of work needs to be done with error correction and it's, you know, you pick up the news and there's always a new company, a new startup that's, you know, there was one last week, was it Atomic? Um, that came out with a thousand qubit system. So it's, it changes, it, cha it comes right out of the blue. And one of the things is, how do we get prepared for this post-quantum era where our legacy crypto is being broken. So, and I've got this down into four phases. Four phases, and this is directly from Michelle Mosca, and he's a university professor at the University of Waterloo, Canada. Um, and again, he was pretty instrumental with ECC, elliptic curve cryptography as well for the BlackBerry at the time. Um, but they run the Perimeter Institute. They do a great job at crypto uh, as well. Um, and so the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to identify 
your assets that you want to protect. Um, that's the first step. And then the second step is you want to be able to understand the impact. So depending upon your data and the data classification techniques that you're using uh, in your organization, you're going to be able to, in your data retention policies, you're going to have to figure out what is that, you know, that crypto validity period, that sweet spot that I'm searching for. Um, and that's your, that's your X plus um, Y. And then phase three, again, you're going to want to profile any of your threat actors, uh, whether they're nation states or whether they're, you know, funded um, um, like Anonymous or other organizations like that. Um, and there, there are hundreds of them. Um, but you're going to want to understand who you're being attacked by and their tools and tactics and techniques such that you're prepared. Um, you have built crypto agility into your organization such that you're able to respond to different crypto algorithms and updates. Someone said to me the other day, and they said, well, post-quantum computing and these algorithms are all fine, Richard, but what happens if, if we reach a state with our quantum hardware where we've got sufficient error correction and I'm able to break the standardized algorithms? What happens then? Um, I didn't have an answer because you know, a lot of the times we're working with these algorithms that have been standardized and then all of the other algorithms have been put onto the, onto the shelf. So we don't have a backup algorithm. Um, and that's another really, really hard problem to think about is what if not only today's legacy crypto gets broken, but the modern cryptography gets broken by a quantum machine. Then we're going to have to advance quite differently and start thinking differently about the problem. It's not just tamper proof, it's not just side channel analysis, but it's just, it's, it's, it's inherently that whole chain, that whole certificate chain, if you will, uh, will be broken. And how do we, how do we protect against that? Um, and I don't have an answer for that. That's, that's, um, that's something for you to think about. That's, it's a really hard problem. So phase four, again, you know, we've identified our assets. We know the crypto validity periods between those assets. We have an idea for when a quantum computer is going to be sufficiently powerful enough, have sufficient error correction um, such that uh, they're go you're going to be able to factor prime numbers. Uh, RSA will be, uh, you know, will be put aside. It will be replaced with something else. Diffie-Hellman for key exchange will also be put aside, uh, and it will be replaced. We will be replaced by some other key encapsulation mechanism. And then phase five, you know, at that point in time, we're able to solve our equation. And phase six, I'm trying to speed it up here. We've got about 10 minutes left. And uh, we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good for time. Um, phase six, again, what I want you to realize is that, and I'm trying to, I do a lot of this, you know, teaching in terms of trying to spread the news about quantum computing and not all the bad, but what we have to do as security researchers to really make it such that our algorithms are sufficiently strong and our financial um, organizations and institutions have faith in them. So why wait for standards? What about building for tomorrow today? Um, and I've got a couple examples of that. So there's uh, in GitHub, the Open Quantum Safe uh, library, libqs. Um, this is one that I've used, I've built with. Uh, OpenSSL, if you've ever built OpenSSL, again, 
it's, it's built with this library. And again, it's, it comes from the team of uh, Michelle Mosca as well. Um, I mentioned, you know, there's lots of algorithms that don't make standardization. Um, and here are just a few, you know, Kyber 512, NTRU Prime didn't make it. It didn't make the cut because of um, someone may have found something that was wrong with it. I forget exactly what it was, but and Frodo K KDM and, uh, and, and Bike, those are other, other algorithms. Um, they all have fancy names. Um, and you know they come from teams of mathematicians and cryptographers that put these things together. But they don't always make the cut for standardization. And that's interesting because, does anyone remember Blowfish? Blowfish, OK, some heads nodding. Um, Blowfish didn't make the cut. AES made the cut as the advanced encryption standard for the US. Um, but Blowfish is still used today. Um, so what are we doing about it? That's another thing that I wanted to talk about. And here's a very, very good example. Um, and I won't go through this all, but um, Signal. Anyone use Signal on their phone? OK. So if you use Signal, they're using post-quantum today, very interestingly enough. So they've got PQ extended diffie Hellman. Um, and sorry, are these slides going to be available for people? Because I, I see them. They are. OK, slides will be available. Um, and there's a lot of great resources in, in the references as well. So you won't have to squint to, to read this. Um, but Signal made the, the choice to protect the user's data. And they're doing that today by you know, using post-quantum post safe Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. Um, but when we start looking at the security properties of, of this particular algorithm, it has some faults. Is it better than RSA? Um, it could be. Is it, you know, does it do authentication in a safe way? Well, they come out and say in the documents that it's actually not quantum secure. But it buys, the, it buys them a little bit of time in terms of being agile with their cryptographic implementations in their software to be able to swap it out for a new algorithm when they're ready. And more security considerations. If you ever do any reading on uh, security considerations and protection profiles, uh, there's a great organization um, called the International Common Criteria, and it's ISO 15408, and they write all of the um, standards protection profiles for many products that are procured by the U.S. government, et cetera. So protection profiles, that's the security properties, the security assertions, that are being made by the product. And more about PQ extended Diffie-Hellman uh, in, uh, in terms of our adversaries, um, some passive and active uh, modes that we can talk about. And again, um, it's made to protect against the uh, uh, um, Harvest now, decrypt later, attack. Uh, there is Chrome support for PQC. Um, Google started supporting that um, back in about 2016. And Cloudflare just announced a couple of weeks ago, I believe, that they now have end-to-end -end support to your origin servers that they're protecting against you know, DDoS and uh, web application firewall uh, attacks. Um, so they've got end-to-end -end protection now um, in using some of the PQ uh, C algorithms. Final thoughts. Um, 
you know, I've tried to take you through this journey today of really kind of thinking about quantum and thinking about the risks that it, a quantum computer presents to uh, security, uh, to security at large, and for what you can do in terms of security research to really kind of address the risks that, um, that those large-scale machines will present to us. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of the internet commerce runs today on legacy, um, legacy crypto. And if that was to be broken, it would be like kind of a Y2K event, or most recently, and where I'm at, um, where you've got a vulnerability in a piece of open source software, and you've got, and you're relying upon that community to actually fix that piece of software for you, and then remember that, you know, X plus Y has got to be less than Z you know, the, the amount of time that we have left to protect our crypto. And with that, um, that's everything I have. If you have any questions. Yeah, we got about five minutes for q and Okay. Over here. Thank you for the insightful talk. So um, what do you think is the key challenge that's can help Noise correction in quantum computers, that's, that's the big one. Um, the for the encryption side? Um, it's really being able to, like right now, we're talking about factoring. And you know, we saw with Rajev's paper, if I think about it in terms of geometry and multi-dimensional space, I can then start factoring numbers um, in bits at different times. And it's, 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 I, I wish I had this visual for you. Um, it actually, you know, it's, it's, it's 3D, he's thinking about the problem, Shor's problem in three-dimensional space now. And he's solving for prime numbers faster. And no one has done that in 30 years. We've always, we've been optimizing Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm for search, but He's applying a different branch of mathematics to actually finding prime numbers, which is quite unusual. Um, so I would say, you know, keep thinking about optimizing that algorithm. And, I, and, and I'd like to see the day where that would actually be programmed on a quantum machine. But if you look at the mathematics behind it, it's, you know, it's, it's quite intense. Thank you. Uh, well, there is no such thing as post-quantum Diffie-Hellman, um, except for in the case of Signal that I mentioned. That was an extended version of Diffie-Hellman, where they're extending some of the parameters. But for key exchange, we're looking at chrysalis dilithium um, as that key encapsulation mechanism that's going to ensure that the communication between your clients and your server is secure for the key exchange. Um, and, and that's a very good question. You know, how do we remain, how do we keep crypto agility to um, be able to swap out algorithms in our systems um, very quickly, uh, being able to be, rebuild OpenSSL at a moment's notice, being able to rebuild it, you know, correctly without supporting many, a list of cipher suites that's, that's this long. You only want to support the very few, the very few that are necessary for your business, and then be able to control them uh, sufficiently such that if you can switch them on or off. Maybe one more question. Uh, historically, we have seen that uh, cryptographers create cryptographic schemes and people break them. So, before 
Yes, yes, definitely. And, and then that's the other challenge is how do we maintain crypto agility with, if we're using standardized, standardized algorithms that are then broken, uh, how do we switch to something else? That something else could have been on that list of algorithms that I said never made the cut for standardization, but didn't have quite the problem uh, in terms of its mathematical proofs. So much. Thank you. A round of applause. So, as someone who is about to retire next year, and I've worked my entire life and save 401k and IRA and all this stuff, this stuff really concerns me. So, it's in your capable hands to make sure that our investments are safe. Please, okay, <laughs> Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really thank appreciate you. it. On behalf of the department, a little little gift for you. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you need something signed to say that you were here, I'll be down front. Uh, gentleman in the white shirt, uh, if you're a computer science graduate student, you haven't checked in, he can help you. Otherwise, I invite you to come back next semester when we launch the series again. Thank you very much. Have a good night.